Good afternoon, uh, I'm Elise Nelson from Vital Voices, and let me just say on behalf of all of us, all my colleagues in the audience from Vital Voices, how absolutely thrilled and honored we are to be a partner with Women in the World and Tina and her fabulous team, not just this year, but for the past six years since the beginning. You know, I think this is such a powerful event because it reminds us so much of the challenges that we face. And we've certainly heard about the enormous challenges facing women and girls in our world over the past 24 hours. Whether it's sexual violence against women, the negative impacts of climate change on women, or economic disparities. And I think at this point in the summit, all of us in this room would probably agree that we are never going to get from where we are today from where we need to be in the future by using the same old strategies. We need innovative solutions. We need you know, innovators who are pioneers. We need to not be afraid to take risks and quite frankly, sometimes fail. So I'm thrilled to be joined today by two truly extraordinary innovators and visionaries. These are two people from two different generations but they are people who think outside the box. Quite frankly, I think both of them don't even know there's a box. <laughs> so let me start with Bunker Roy. Um, he's a living legend. He actually got quite mad at me backstage when he found out I was planning to say this. Uh, but I told him, it's true, so I'm saying it. Uh, he's the founder of Barefoot College in Rajasthan, India. It's world-renowned at this stage and has been replicated around the world. For 43 years, this man has been creating sustainable, locally driven and sourced solutions to some of the greatest challenges facing our world. And what I love about him is that he's put women right at the center of the solution. Think about that. And let me tell you, this man did it long before it was popular or we had studies to prove it was a good idea. Sanjita Gajapati Raju is founder of Sana, and she is the winner of the very prestigious global, uh, Google Global Impact Challenge. Her mission at Sana is to forge public-private partnerships, so really engage business and the priv and private sector as well as government, to enable rural villages and urban slums to have safe drinking water and sanitation. And she's going to tell us why that's so critically important. But she uses technology to really enable this. I was surprised to learn backstage that she's not a technologist. She's not studied that when I told her that I am not. She, she shared with me that she is not either. So let's start with you, Bunker. One of the things that I've certainly learned over two decades working with extraordinary leaders around the globe is that all of them have this sort of aha moment, this moment where they realize this is what I'm supposed to do. This is my calling in life. This is how I'm going to change the world. And it truly changes everything. Tell us about your path, because I know it was not exactly what your mother planned. <laughs> now it can be told. I went to a very snobbish, expensive, elitist school and college in India, and that almost destroyed me. Mm. I was all set to be a doctor, teacher, diplomat, lawyer. And then I went to a village for the first time in 1965. And I saw death, starvation, hunger for the first time. And that was the other part of India I'd never seen. And I was wondering why I was in such an exclusive, cloistered school and college which never exposed me to the other side of India. So when I came back home, I told my mother that I'd like to live and work in a village. Mother went into a coma. <laughs> she said, uh, what is this happening to you? You know, everything is laid out for you and now you want to go into this village? What do you want to do there? I said, I want to be an unskilled laborer digging wells in Rajasthan. <laughs> she didn't speak to me for many years because she felt I'd let my f country and my family down because her most embarrassing moment was, what will we tell the family? You went to such expensive education, all of a sudden you want to be an unskilled laborer digging wells. But that was when I was exposed to the most extraordinary knowledge and skills that very poor people have, and that's when I started the Barefoot College mm. 43 years ago. So, Sanchaita, I know that in many ways your path um, was different in the fact that your mother, who's a parliamentarian, always exposed you to these issues. But at the same time, you were set to be, you know, in the film industry and media industry. You were hanging out at cons and, and, you know, doing all these interesting things. And then all of a sudden you take this sort of radical detour 
to build toilets for the rural poor. How does one, you know, how does one take that path? <laughs> well, if you'd asked me a few years ago, maybe five years ago, would I be sitting here in the midst of all of you? I would have said never in the wildest of my dreams. I mean, I was, like you said, in a very different space. I was working in the media with my family. I am a lawyer. But somewhere I felt that at the end of every day, I didn't feel that I'd found my calling. I was still looking for something, something to make me, you know, feel that this is it and you don't want to look any further. And there comes a point in life when if you don't take that risk at that point, you get so comfortable in, in the daily routine that exists that you just say, I don't want to take that risk. Because when I was very young, I had seen my mom do a lot of work in the social sector that did have a deep impact, because I think when you're young, you're a little less cynical about the whole world, you're a little more idealistic. But, you know, the routine, mundane activities of life took over, and I went down a very conventional path. Many years later, I was in a place called Gulbarga, which is a place in Karnataka, and I was working with my father on a film where they were documenting the benefits of technology as an enabler for agricultural intervention. And that's when I remember when I came back to Delhi, I said, I don't want to work with you guys anymore. I want to work in the not-for-profit sector, but I want to use technology because I feel that technology can be used to transform lives. And that's how the whole journey began. You know, I think one of the things that in, in learning about the two of you and talking to the two of you that really impressed me is that both of you, unlike I think many other well-meaning NGOs around the world, um, really take a sort of locally sourced solution approach. So you really believe that the solutions are there. Even if people aren't educated, the solutions are there in the communities. And rather than bring the solutions in from outside, as the international community has been doing for decades, you believe in really sort of nurturing and learning from those locally sourced solutions. You talk about it as being very organic. C can you explain a little bit more about how you established the Barefoot College and, and really incorporated that model, how you learned that model? When in doubt, always listen to Gandhi. Hmm. <laughs> and Mahatma Gandhi said, that if you don't take the people into confidence, if you don't take their resources, knowledge, skills, and wisdom into confidence, you will never improve their quality of life. So the Barefoot College identified knowledge, skills, and wisdom which you'll find anywhere in India, indeed the world, which is re not recognized, which has been devalued, because we feel something that comes from outside the village is superior, and that is nonsense, because you have tremendous knowledge and skills and wisdom in the villages itself. And if you only recognize that, respect that, apply that, you can't go wrong. That's why we have such great fights with the World Bank and the UN, because they're all top down. They're not bottom up, and they haven't got it right for 60 years. I wonder why. <laughs> So, Sanchaita, I know that you as well believe very much in sort of village local ownership yes. of your projects. How, how do you instill that local ownership and buy-in? Well, to begin with, if you want anything to be sustainable and if you're looking at the long term, then unless you bring and take people, all the stakeholders along, it really doesn't work. So what we do is we work with the local government, which is like the panchayat. This is a very, it's in a village of a population ranging between 1,500 upwards. And they elect a person for a period of five years. So we work with the panchayat and they have a stake in the project. The entire ownership vests with them. We work with people from within the village. We train them. There's local employment. There's revenue generation from within the community. And that gives them a huge sense of you know, pride, because they feel this is not my project, this is their project, this is their idea, and this is their solution. And that, I think, is very important. Um, can you just give us a story of, of one of the women that you work with um, through your project and, you know, how it changed her life? You know, we, we try and focus and work more with women than with men because I feel that that is a more sustainable solution. So in a village called Bodhubalsa, uh, <laughs> that's true, isn't it? I mean, you know, it, it, it works. So uh, we have, there's this young lady, her name is Lakshmi. 
She has been trained by us to manage and operate the entire system in a village called Bodhuvalsa. And when you go and you see her face, the pride with which she goes to work every day in the morning to say that I have learned how to do this, I can operate the system, the kind of confidence that that instills in a person is amazing. And that's what we're trying to do, that you, don't, you really don't need to be a rocket scientist to be able to do it. Anybody can do it. You just need to have that passion in you and the opportunity to, be, to rise to the occasion. Then. Mm. <laughs> Bunker, I know you two are, as I said earlier, a strong believer in women and the power of women to bring about greater solutions. But what's fascinating to me is that you've not just invested in women, but really illiterate women, and you've not actually tried to teach them to read, and I want you to explain why. But it's also grandmothers. Of course, I learned these grandmothers are 37, so they're younger than me, but, <laughs> but nonetheless, tell us why, why women, why illiterate women, and why grandmothers? What's the most powerful way of communicating today? Is it television? Is it telephone? Is it telegraph? It's tell a woman. <laughs> <laughs> that may just go down as the best one-liner of the day. <laughs> All right, the second one is better. Okay. <laughs> because after 30 years of working and living in a village, especially villages which are very remote and inaccessible, and you go to these very remote and inaccessible, you'll find very young people, and very old people. The middle people have just left. Mm. The young, the youth have just left looking for a job in a city. So we came up with a very profound observation. We found men were untrainable. Mm. <laughs> men are restless, men are ambitious, men are compulsively mobile, and all of them want a certificate. And the moment you give a man a certificate, he leaves a job, he leaves the village looking for a job in the city. So why not invest in grandmothers? Mm. Grandmothers who are between 35 and 50, who have never left their villages in their lives, who, have no, who, who are not a role model. And these people, we found, are extraordinary. Mm. We have now been to 69 countries, and trained 700 grandmothers in all these countries. Wow. And not one failure. Yeah. Not one failure. I was, um, I was, uh, it, it was interesting to learn in, in, in find, learning about you that oh, you've trained almost every single solar technician, female solar technician across Africa. We have covered the whole continent of Africa. So your model's really being replicated. And the 300 grandmothers we have trained are the only solar engineers of Africa because the men have left. It's mm. only the women who are actually wow. looking after the communities. And they are the success stories today. So now, uh, we train grandmothers using sign language. You don't use the written or spoken word. Okay. It's only through sign language. You find 40 grandmothers every six months coming to the Barefoot College, all speaking to each other but not understanding a word because they're speaking Jola or Spanish or Wolof. But the body language is great. And within six months, through sign language, they know more about solar engineering than any graduate after five years of university. Wow. Can you imagine? Yeah. And I was also thinking about you use puppets. Is that right? They come as grandmothers and go back like tigers. <laughs> Absolute extraordinary. We had a, there might have been just almost one failure. When we had this grandmother from Benin, and they came, and within one month we got a telegram saying, these women have forgotten everything. And the minister is coming to inaugurate it within a month. So in that same course, we had a battle axe of a grandmother from Mauritania. I flew that battle axe of a grandmother from Mauritania <laughs> into Benin, and when these two women saw this battle axe, they remembered everything. <laughs> and they solar electrified the first village of Benin. I want to hear really quickly about the puppets that you use. 
to teach it. Wherever there's a high percentage of illiteracy and you don't um, have television or the newspapers, we use puppets, glove puppets. And that's the transfer of technology because in India you have traditional puppets which are string puppets and only 50 people can watch. But with a glove puppet, over 5,000 people can watch. And all these puppets talk about... And this puppet we have is a 300-year-old Muslim uh, called Jokim Chacha who knows the gossip of everything is happening in the village. <laughs> and he is my psychoanalyst, doctor, teacher, lawyer, donor. Yeah. He solves all my problems for me. And the best part is that these puppets are made out of World Bank reports. <laughs> I'm glad they're going to use. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, <laughs> um, Sanchita, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, so tell me about, I know that you believe that, that water and sanitation is very much a women's issue. Mm -hmm. Talk about that a little bit. Well, you know, we have 600 million Indians who defecate out in the open every day. 600 million Indians. Th those are the numbers. And when you talk about women's issues and safety and them, you know, not wanting to be raped or wanting to live a dignified life, I think water and sanitation is the first stumbling block that they face. Girls drop out of school because they have to go and fetch water. They drop out of school when they don't have a toilet, when they hit puberty. You know, they, have, uh, they uh, fall prey to malnutrition and stunting because they don't have safe sanitation. So, I mean, water and sanitation is at the heart of most of the problems that women face. Mm -hmm. And when you don't give them access to this, it is one of the most humiliating things because there's nothing more ravaging for human dignity than having to defecate out in the open and drink contaminated water. It's not something that many of us can imagine because, you know, you don't have to worry if I'm opening up a bottle, am I going to have diarrhea at the end of it or is my child going to die because they don't have access to clean water? So this is at the heart of every one of the problems that women face, especially in India, because this is a reality they live with. So the, the, the bio-toilets um, are all sort of... Um, placed in a particular part of the village and grouped together. Why is that? Can you explain that a little bit? There's a strategy I know behind that. There is, actually, because in reality, we don't have the caste system it, it, on paper, but in reality, that couldn't be further from the truth. Mm. And in every village, you have what is called the Dalit community area, where, which is the lowest caste, where members of the Dalit community live. And if you see the way they live, you will not believe that you're in 2015 because it's some of the most inhuman visuals that you can ever imagine, which is why we work with them and we house everything in what is called the SE community in a village, hoping that they should have, they're the most vulnerable and they should have access to the resources first, and hoping that, you know, when people from the higher castes come in to get water, clean water, then a conversation starts, and that's when barriers get broken down. Mm. So that's great. That's great. Mm. And it's 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 interesting too because that that kind of change is the hardest to come by, and these very out of the box strategies, as we talked about, are the ways to do it. Bunker, I wonder if you could just talk about kind of building on what Sanchaita said about how um, confidence of women, how women are changed um, when they, you know, gain the skills that you provide them, when they realize that, you know, what they have, you know, is of value, even if they are illiterate, don't have, you know, a great education, how they are valued. Um, and I know there's a, there's a governance structure in particular um, within, your, uh, within your colleges. Uh, explain a little bit about that, the governance and political structure. I'd like to tell you some stories, actually. Yeah, please. <laughs> we took the first three women from Afghanistan to the Barefoot College, and they wouldn't come with, uh, they wouldn't be allowed to come without the men. So the men also came. Of course, they were less intelligent than the women. The women picked up the solar engineering uh, like duct or water, it was fantastic. They went back and solar electrified the first five villages ever in Afghanistan in 2008. Mm. When there were 700 UN experts sitting there, there was not one village solar electrified when they actually did it. 
And when this woman solar electrified the village and went and sat with the men, the men said, what do you think you're doing? You should be sitting with those women there one kilometer away. Why are you sitting with me? And she said something very profound. She said, today, I'm not a woman, I'm an engineer. And I've solar electrified the village for you. And it hit them between the eyes for the first time that this was not a grandmother, this was an engineer who solar electrified their village. So many instances of women being told by the men, ah, if you go for six months, I'll take another man. Go off, doesn't matter. In spite of this threat, the woman goes to the Barefoot College, comes back and solar electrifies the whole village, and they're in total awe, and the men say, please come back. <laughs> but in Burkina Faso, this woman went and came back, and the man said, come back, and she said, no, I'm quite happy now. I don't, <laughs> I don't want you. I'm fine. So this mindset change that has come about because these women have been exposed to like-minded women like them, for 40 of them for six months, is absolutely life-changing. And I think this is the way that you change mindset. Yeah. Set an example, exactly. show what is possible, and then leave it to them to sort this out at the village level. Yeah. And I know you're doing that so much with girls as well. And I, I'd love for you to tell a story that I know you told me a bit about um, backstage. Um, of we have um, uh, schools at night for boys and girls who can't go to school in the morning because they look after cattle and sheep and goats. Mm -hmm. And there are about 200 night schools and 7,000 children coming to these schools. But the beauty is that every three years we have an election where these little girls, between boys and girls, between 6 and 14, elect a prime minister. And the prime minister looks after 20 goats in the morning, but she's prime minister in the evening. <laughs> she has a cabinet, and the cabinet monitors and supervises these, 100, these 225 schools. All the prime ministers are girls, much to the regret to the boys because the boys have to settle to being members of being the leader of the opposition or <laughs> speaker of the house. They hate it. She went and got the world's children's prize five years ago from the Queen of Sweden. And the Queen of Sweden just couldn't believe that this 12-year-old girl, girl had never left her village in her life. And look at the way she was handling it as if she'd been in Sweden all her life. And she turned to me and said, please ask this girl, where did she get her confidence from? The girl was very insulted and looked at the queen straight in the eye and said, please tell her I'm the prime minister. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, have you been to the UN? Have you talked to people there? <laughs> so, one last question, because we're totally out of time, although I'm sure we could go on with great stories all afternoon, and I'm, you're, people are going to be mobbing you both, I'm sure, um, to hear more. As, as you know, and Mary Robinson, uh, former President Mary Robinson, talked about it earlier today, this is a historic year. It's a once-in-a-generation opportunity with the Sustainable Development Goals. Obviously, what you work on and women at the center of it all is so critical. But as you know, there are 17 goals in this document that's been put together. You know, everything under the sun, it's extremely broad. There are 169 targets. Um, how do we bring some of your, stop laughing. How do we bring some of your um, innovative thinking, uh, entrepreneurial spirit um, to this document and to implementing it? How do we make it real for people on the ground? Well, I think, like you said, if we listen more, because the solutions are out there, and poor people don't need poor solutions. We need to listen to their voice and involve them in the conversation. And if we do that, I think we've pretty much will reach home safe and sound. I think that's the most important thing to do. Yeah, yeah. Can I ask you something? And this is the last, last question. Does she make you proud about the future? She intimidates me. <laughs> 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 the other way around. <laughs> well, thank you both. This has been so much fun thank and you. really inspiring at the same time. Thank you.